महेल कुंजवार आज जिस विषय पर वो बात करेंगे वो है स्पेस टाइम एंड आर्ट माय रिफ्लेक्शंस वी लुक फॉरवर्ड टू हिज रिफ्लेक्शंस बिकॉज ही इज अ मेजर फिगर ऑफ आवर टाइम ऑन सम ऑफ दीज वेरी क्रूशियल इश्यूज रिलेटिंग टू आर्ट दैट इज स्पेस एंड टाइम वी हैड इन आवर ओन ट्रेडिशन a lot of thought being given a lot of chintan taking place on desh and kal and their relationship to kala over to mahesh ji now ah uh, that's it good evening friends all when i say i'm truly honored and feel privileged that i have been invited here by name in the and uh, nataranga pratishthan to deliver a lecture uh, it is not a formal opening as they generally are because i personal um, my personal association with name ji goes back to about uh, 1978 1980 and i have many fond memories of my time spent with him whenever i came to delhi when i received a phone call from kirti saying that you have to come it brought along many memories many fond memories of my time spent with him and uh there was no question of saying no because i hold him in great regard i mean i can't <coughs> Special <clears throat> scene in this country, and particularly in Delhi, without Nemiji, he was a key figure. He still is a key figure there. I remember him when I met him first, sometime in 1978, maybe. Um, I had uh, I had gone to Rabindra Bhavan to see a play at the Open Air Theatre. Yes, how was it? i went and uh, introduced myself to him he looked at me and said you are wearing just a t-shirt it gets chilly in the evening and he offered me shawl i was really touched and i protested i said no no it's all right i i can manage he said you don't know it gets chilly take this shawl i have another warm jacket i mean i was really touched because uh, this kind of uh, kindness is so unexpected it was such a fatherly gesture to a green horn and that is a moment i will always cherish in uh, and uh, i think it is this small spontaneous acts of kindness that really light up your life and make the business of living bearable after that we usually meet at seminars and uh, as is my wont i would often burst out into a tirade a passionate tirade uh, about something very trivial and uh, you would look at me with a smooth smile and uh, later on when we meet for a tea break or uh, a lunch break he would just come near me and pat on my shoulder kindly and warmly like a father who understands his son he was not a man who would speak much he was a man of few words i think and uh, very soft spoken so when i had all these memories about him uh, i said of course i will come and then kirti asked me uh, what is going to be the topic i was i think working in the garden at the time and off the cuff i said all right i will i will speak about uh, space and time in our she said fine speak about it we are looking forward to it it is afterwards that i realized that i had put myself into a tight spot because the more i thought on that subject uh the more i realized that at it is a, a, a vast subject of great magnitude and people have been talking about these two things for 
centuries and nobody has a final experience or a final uh, take on that. And what am I putting myself into? But then I got cold feet, frankly speaking, because I am not a scholar and I have not really read much about these things. Whatever I am going to say will be because of my personal experience of uh, theater and other arts. So you will find me uh, a bit confused from time to time, but uh, and again, it is not my promise that I'm going to enlighten you or give you clear answers about this topic. In fact, I'm here to include you into my confusion. I would like you to share my confusion. And uh, this is what I'm here for. Now, my argument here will be intellectually perceptible, some people, with all its limitations, because uh, as I have told you, I am no you'll die scholar, but uh, most of it is a, a, a coming up of my experiences. And I have been engaged with the topic and space since about 1975 or 80, you know, when I started writing back in 1967, I had no idea what these things meant to me. I just wrote instinctively, I must be a playwright. And that's why I wrote plays. And uh, I, di I didn't know that I was handling space in theater. I just read about it and uh, the plays were done and they worked. And I didn't know how much contribution comes from a director. My plays were directed by Vijay, by my initial work was great. And uh, I live in Nagpur, she lives in Mumbai. So we hardly met. I used to go there at the opening and uh, we never talked about these things. By instinct, made, I say by instinct I'm a playwright because I, I guess uh, somebody comes to me and says, well, I have a wonderful story, sir. I would like to dramatize it. And I said, if you are a story writer, if you are written a story, keep it a story. If you want to write a play, it should occur to you as a play. Do you see it happening on stage? No, sir, I think uh, if you are not seeing it happening in stage, on stage, 40 by 30 something, whatever the space is, then you are not a playwright. This much I could say, but even then I did not know what I was talking about. Then uh, time went on and then uh, many uh, months, uh, Vijayabai said that Mahesh, do you know that you use only my earlier players were like that, you know. Mahesh, you use only two or three characters on stage. It's a vast area. And uh, you do not uh, use all the space. There is so much space. It should be used by the characters. I am doing all the things. The tricks that you see are being done by the director. But as a writer, do you ever think about it? I said, no, I had never thought about it, but now I realize I had to learn and I will. So immediately afterwards, I came back to Nagpur from Bombay. I decided to use the area, all area, entire area now, 40 by 35 or something. And I decided to people it with about 10 to 12 characters. Uh, I was trying to achieve uh, Aristotle unity, you know, three unities also. That is when I wrote party. I used to have a stack of papers with me and I had colored pencils with me and I decided that green color will be Mohini, red color will be Barbe, like that, about 12 colored pencils representing 12 characters and I drew the map of the stage and I used to move those people from this point to that point and I used to prepare about three to four drafts for every scene 
every small scene. It was fun, but then I was a greenhorn and I had uh, to learn and this was a wonderful way of learning. That is when I realized what physical space, visual space in theater is. And the, that was the first conscious understanding of the physical space available to me. And then uh, when I wrote the play completely, till that moment, I was aware only of uh, visual space, whatever we saw, whatever we see in a given space. After I finished writing my play, uh, I thought I would read out to myself how it sounds because it has three or four languages used and I was writing dialogue, which is an artificial thing. Dialogue is always artificial structure, but it has to sound like conversation. This much I knew. So I read it out to myself. And suddenly I realized that, my God, there is one more space here in theater. And that is acoustic space. I'm listening to my dialogue and uh, my wound, my habit as a playwright has been, I mean, I have created pauses in most of my texts. And this was done instinctively before, later on it became a you know, part of my craft also. Sometimes I intentionally introduced pauses uh, and uh, I realized that there is a kind of uh, probe about the acoustic speech. Have I used it sensibly? Have I used it correctly? What is the relation of the acoustic space and the physical space? Can I, can I synchronize the visual space and acoustic space to, together? What was very important? And uh, that is when I realized that while using, uh, using um, the acoustic space, why did I introduce pauses where nothing is said? Sometimes I was incapable of saying something which uh, I thought has to be said but cannot be said, so I created pauses. It was my inability who could not use dramatic language maybe. Sometimes I didn't want the particular character to, to speak out his or her mind for a variety of reasons. Then at, at, after some time, I gradually realized that I was trying to say a lot more in the pauses where nothing was said than in the main text which was written. Which means I had created Initially, unconsciously, now I do it consciously. I created a subtext, subtext or sometimes many subtexts in those pauses. The real play was in the pauses. The real play was never said out by the characters. And uh, that is how it should be, I think, according to me. A good play is that which you say, uh, I mean, you can use a very uh, insignificant dialogue, trivial dialogue. Uh, a dialogue which is a sort of fracture dialogue, non-sequential dialogue. And uh, you might think that what's happening and they are not saying anything to each other. But if you have used uh, pauses sensibly, correctly, you are able to see something very deep, something moving, something deeper. Uh, without spelling it out, pauses do the job, pauses do the business of saying all those things. Of course, the actor has to learn to decipher those pauses. And again, the beauty of that is 10 different actors would decipher those pauses differently in 10 different matters. And the play would be uh, something new every time you see a new, uh, something times you see a play with a different actor and a different director, but that is the fun of theater. It never goes stale. Every 
new um, production is a, a new experiment and it is different from the earlier production it's not like cinema the cinema is the same every time you see it it's, it's never like that in theater so this is when uh, the challenges were overwhelming the challenges were evolving uh, in fact these are basics every playwright has to learn them and if he becomes conscious of them uh, sometimes it helps uh, honing up his craft and uh, i relied heavily on this all when all this was happening i was trying to reach a particular level of excellence and uh, sometimes i fell sometimes i succeeded and that is when i met uh, roindi tai bhate we used to call her baby tai everybody knows roindi bhate you know, the great kathak dancer the great scholar great sanskritist she was a very scholarly person deep in natya uh, steep in natya shastra and other sanskrit texts and uh, we sat together and we decided that uh, we shall have a small workshop where one writer a playwright particularly a poet also one vocalist one percussionist one dancer one painter we all will get together and we spent three days together and everybody would talk about his uh, way of negotiating with the space and time in his uh, respective art i would talk about those things as far as theater is concerned prabhakar kolte we, we we were going to invite he would talk about space is a very articulate person somehow it did take off and uh, why we were talking to each other like this i mean we had a very nice uh, relationship i was much junior to her and she treated uh, treated me as an equal and uh, we often met and talked about trivial things so it was not always something very important or arty but while we were talking like this i asked her a very juvenile question and i shouldn't have asked it but i did i said uh, baby dai you have been dancing for the last 65 years and uh, it has been such a long journey and do you think you have reached your destination now baby dai's way of responding to such silly questions was very remarkable she used to be very brief and sometimes that brevity was deceptive as she used to be very brief and very quiet while answering and if you had some sense you would ponder over it and realize that she has said something very profound she never spelled it out she never explained or elucidated never she was almost uh, upanishadic you know like uh, asukta you know very condensed very condensed and it was just change subject so when i asked her baby they have you you have traveled so much journeyed so much and have you reached your destination and she very quietly said i didn't want to go anywhere that was all i was stunned for a minute because i had never met any artist till that time who would say that i i don't want anything i don't want to go anywhere and i had seen devita's life she had never courted favor from anybody she had never pined for all that uh, brings momentary uh, momentary happiness to us that's her answer fell on my ears like thunder i said my god there is much more to it there is much more to art and uh, i have set so many destinations petty destinations all right not very big destinations and i have always wanted to reach there and i had reached many of them and that was the moment i when i realized that well yes i had reached my destinations but i have never felt fulfilled 
the happiness did come to me and lasted for a couple of hours. The happiness was not transformed into a lasting joy. What were my priorities in art? My mind was still full of restlessness, angst, paranoia even, anxiety. These were my inner problem. This was my inner world. And I realized that the, uh, these achievements, external achievements, had no connection with them. My so-called uh, achievements had no relation to my inward life, my internal life. They were in fact antithetical to each other. I realized that well, my mind, I mean, I had these existential problems and they had no answer. They could not be resolved. They could not be answered by my uh, material gains. You know. So that means that my art, I am not saying about everybody, my art, my art had not failed to give me anything. I had failed myself. It was sort of self-defeating because I had not given um, deep thought to what my priorities are going to be as an artist. My friends, I must tell you that my entire argument is uh, premised on, uh, on one uh, observation, one assumption, and that is artists are basically seekers. You might think that is a generalization. And, um, well, there are perhaps many artists who are not seekers, but I personally think that you cannot really run away from it. You are born with this. And there are three types of seekers, mystics, artists, and scientists. And they are seeking the same thing, although their means are totally different. A scientist employs his own tools, an artist employs his own tools and mystic has his own way of reaching that particular destination and that destination is this, that destination is the absolute while i'm talking about it i have to come back to time and space in theater and how it either helps me or it does not help me to propel myself into this direction, which is full of fog, in fact. The deeper you think about it, you know, the first few tips are fine, you know, small road, and then there are many violins, and you walk into some violin, and they are, it is filled with fog, and you are completely lost, and you do not know where you are, where you are going. And uh, that too is a part of the voyage, I think. That too is a part of the journey, an artistic journey. It is an internal journey. It is a, it is a journey into the interior. And uh, if you are surrounded by a fog, stay there. I mean, there is nothing else you can do because you cannot even come back now. But that was one a life-changing moment when David or Ronita said that I didn't want to go anywhere. And I said, my God. I had wanted to go everywhere. You know. I wanted everything, all the material goodies. You know. And I thought, the material, when the, once the material goodies come to me, I'll be a very happy person. And then now, I wasn't. I wasn't. Which made me examine my life, which made me examine my priorities, which made me examine my approach to art, my life, my values. It was a, a very disturbing moment. It was, in fact, uh, it, it shattered me no end. And I realized that, my God, I was so completely blind to these things. You know. They are the things that really matter. And I had never thought of them. I was happy writing. I was happy my plays being produced. I was happy getting either big bags or bouquets. And for me, it was fun. But after this particular incident, 
it didn't remain fun for me. It became a very serious pursuit. Rohinita has been Rohinita has been very influential, uh, and because uh, she was a really a dedicated person. So I talked to her. I said a lot of questions have been haunting me, and uh, I do not know how to answer them. She said, "Why do you try? Don't." You're writing, keep writing. I dance. I don't ask myself any questions. So that is how it all started. And then I realized that I had negotiated with the acoustic space and uh, the physical space. So I soon learned that creating spaces, creating um, pauses, I would say, rather not spaces, pauses, sometimes small pauses, sometimes big pauses, um, which hide the subtext, which hide the real play. It is a part of craft, mostly it is a part of craft. But I, again, I used to confuse those pauses with silence. Pause is not a silence. Pause is different. Silence is different. We'll come to that later on. But again, um, I will come back to another talk with Baby Thai. And she once asked me, Mahesh, do you like Kathak? I know. But what do you like most in the dance form? And I said, uh, well, uh, I like everything about it, but uh, I, like that, I like that particular moment, that particular moment when the dancer finishes her first dancing phase, dancing phrase, and comes, to, comes on the sum and still or silent for two seconds, and then she goes to another uh, dancing phrase. She said, it, there is not stillness. What you're saying is not stillness. Stillness is implicit with silence. This is a pause, and pause is full of possibilities. This particular pause in dance at least has two things, you know. It gives you time to release what you have seen. It also awakens some kind of expectancy in you to find out what's happening next. Next, It's always a pause. So I don't think we should confuse pause with silence. And when I thought about it, I realized that, yes, it's impossible. When I started writing dialogue, I realized that I was creating pauses and not silence because there is nothing like silence in our lives. As long as we are trapped by the three unities, as long as you cannot transcend the three unities, no, sorry, I, I mistake, um, three um, time, space, and uh, it's very difficult to understand what silence is. Just a minute, I look at my. So, I, when I was, uh, I started writing plays, three dimensions I, I wanted to see, not three unities. Our lives are imprisoned in three dimensions, and as long as we are trapped into three dimensions, it is impossible to understand what silence is. Although ultimate, everybody ultimately wants to go there. I, earlier I said everybody wants to reach the absolute, and the absolute is completely silent. Instead of the absolute, you could, you could say eternity, or you could say any other word which are generally used by religious texts, but I'm not going into that area anymore. 
So it was at that time that I realized that my art, writing for theater, is so constricted. That is when I became sort of envious of musicians, vocalists, and painters. My tool was language. And when I used language, I realized that language is such a corrupted, overused tool. It has associations piled on it for centuries. It is also under the burden of historic historicity. It's very difficult to write uh, what you really want to because language can spoil it. Using language can spoil it. From this time to Chomsky, people have been telling about the deceptive nature of language and uh, overuse of language also. And uh, language has become a very banal tool. Um, more than communicating, communicating with each other, we end up non-communicating with each other. Sometimes it's miscommunication, wrong communication. That was one really, uh, one important reason for me to employ pauses in my work. I envy vocalists because their tools are so pure, they are so natural. Swar, notes, sare gamma padanisa, they are so natural. They are the purest. They are not contaminated by um, anything like a language is. A sharja is always the sharja. Rishab is always rishab. Daivat is always rishab, nothing else. And if you want to reach a pure destination, you have to have pure means also, which vocalists have. They perhaps are able to transcend the limitations of these three dimensions we spoke about. Painters also. Colors are very natural, but not language. That is one limitation of language. And I was writing, um, I was using language for theater, which is necessarily a collective art. I write one word or why I write one sentence, and then it can be uttered in a variety of ways by a variety of uh, actors, and it can have many interpretations. Sometimes, enriching but wrong, sometimes not enriching, still wrong. There is a possibility of uh, using the phrase or a sentence uh, in a wrong manner because the actor has a, a certain interpretation of it. So I myself am not communicating with my audience, the actor is. So all our writers aspire to achieve what vocalists or musicians can manage to do, or a painter can manage to do. I would like to uh, do, uh, I would like to achieve the same thing that uh, Kumar Gandharji could or guys on Danish paintings did. But I have yet to see a play which has really given me that feeling of abstract uh, experience. A mystical experience particularly can be perhaps expressed in theater, uh, sorry, not in theater, in music, but uh, rarely in literature. I mean, people have been talking about it. People have been talking about it, but uh, it's always, you by using words and using associations, bringing many images together, that you suggest that particular experience while music, you don't have to even use words while singing, you know, you just do your alapi and you are in a 
different world. Again, expression, I think, is a wrong word here. I wouldn't say expression because expression is a very conscious act. It's a very conscious act of conveying a concrete experience. And here we are talking about something abstract, which all of us try to do. I must tell you an anecdote. Kishori Tai and Amanpur and Vijay Bhai were talking to each other. I was there and Kishori Tai said, well, yours is an inferior art. You cannot go to abstract, we do. And uh, we didn't really have a prompt answer to it. And I mean, I started telling her how Beckett has done it, you know, how she was not in this. I mean, the, but since then, I have been trying to find out how many times has theater or a writer, playwright, has been able to take you to complete abstraction of experience. I think uh, Beckett is the only uh, person who could do a great extent do it, but uh, many others have failed. Now, uh, a mystical experience, there is a very um, wrong understanding about mystical experience uh, being transmitted to the audience, you know. I wouldn't name anybody, but I know a couple of people who announce themselves as spiritual theater workers and uh, all that they do is make a spiritual statement which is intellectually perceptible. Now, this is such an experience that it cannot be grasped by intellect for the same plain and simple reason that it is beyond the grasp of intellect. Like as I told you, language cannot express this experience because language is a product of human intelligence and the language can go as far as the intelligence goes. Beyond that, there is silence, a bad kind of silence. While the vocalist can sing and use all the natural, well, use na uh, its natural or her natural uh, tools and maybe sometimes uh, open up the mystical experience, a crack, it's possible. I mean, I think I have been at least to Eric, I mean, I have experienced it at least twice in my life. Once what it was Kumar, Kumarji. Another time it was Kishori, of course. So making a statement and telling people how it is spiritual is, I mean, you can give a spiritual statement, but you can never give an experience. Making a statement is not really theater, you have to give, I mean, a direct experience, the essence of experience to it. I would make or uh, elucidate this uh, particular point uh, by, uh, I mean, sort of deviating, I know, but allow me to deviate to make my point clear. The difference between intellectual statement of spirituality and uh, uh, experience of spirituality, a direct experience, experience of spirituality. We know about Sartre, Jean Paul Sartre and uh, Beckett. Sartre preceded Beckett and he was one of the greatest existentialists of his time and uh, was a great uh, proponent of absurdity, nothingness. And he wrote a few plays like uh, In Camera or uh, The Flies and uh, Lucifer and the Lord. When you read his plays, uh, you are dazzled by his intellect, which was scintillating. And at the same time, you realize that, yeah, my intellect is being informed, what brilliant arguments. But he's it is really a paradox, you know, in a way, making a statement of nothing, making a statement about nothingness, making a very 
uh, organized, concrete, intellectually worked out statement about nothingness is such a, a self-defeating exercise. You cannot intellectually organize thoughts about absurd, about nothing. So I say my intellect is informed. I know what Sartre wants to say, but when I watch the play, I do not experience it. My mind starves. My mind remains thirsty. That is when Beckett comes in. Beckett did not allow any intellectual argument to, inferior, uh, to interfere in his work. He gives us uh, a direct experience of absurdity. And uh, if you read Beckett's plays chronologically, right from Waiting for Godot to Breath, you realize that he begins to abbreviate his means. He begins to abbreviate his text also. Characters speak very few lines. There are longer pauses. Even the size of the text becomes smaller and smaller. Finally, he wrote a play which ran for about 38 seconds. You know that. I mean, it's called The Breath, where the curtain opens and there is Nothing on stage except total silence, stillness, if you can use the word now, in a usual manner. And after some time, suddenly the silence of the stage is splintered by a cry of a baby and a deep sigh. Somebody taking a breath and releasing it. In. People thought that, I mean, quite a people thought that, well, it was one of those quirky, quirky things Beckett has written. I personally think that Beckett was in search of silence and it is not available. We do not know what silence is in our three uh, dimensional lives. Even if I am sitting in a closed room, and there is nobody else, it's completely silent. Silent in the sense, in our usual terminology. I realize that there is no silence because my veins are throbbing, my pulse is throbbing, blood is racing through my veins, my heart is thumping. Not only this, my mind is blabbering all the time, ceaselessly blabbering. Mind never stops. It is ceaselessly talking. There is no silence because a silence is a thing within. Silence is not without. Now, all artists were trying to seek this silence in the sense, and this kind of silence is possible, possibly. I mean, this is just an imagination. This kind of silence is possible uh, when you reach the absolute, when you reach the eternity. If you remember right, uh, I mean, eternity is not something uh, I'm talking about. I'm the first to talk about and people have been talking about uh, for long. And in the Western uh, literature and Western philosophy, uh, it has uh, sort of become a very negative thing. You know. I'll come to that later on. But uh, before that, before one reaches this point, to try to unshackle oneself from the shackles of dimensions, there is a preparatory period also. I mean, it is really wrong to, cons uh, to think that an all artist loves to be surrounded by people. I'm talking about the monastic um, artist, the artist who is a seeker, the artist who is, uh, wants to be left alone. 
I uh, this reminds me of a poem I had read. Uh, I mean, many many years ago, and it has stayed with me. This is a poem which uh, is an inscription found in some old temple. I do not know who wrote the inscription or what the temple is, but I found this poem. I will read it out to you so that you would know what a preparatory mental state of an artist can be. The lines go like this. Stranger, think long before you enter. For these corridors amuse not passing travelers. But you enter, keep your voice to yourself. Nor should you tinkle and toll your tongue. These columns rose not for the such as you, but for those urgent pilgrim feet that wander on lonely ways, seeking the roots of fruitless trees. The earth has many flowery roads. Choose one that pleases your whim and God's be with you. But now leave, leave me to my dark green solitude, which like the deep dream world of the sea has its moving ships, corals, ancient coins, carved urns and ruins of ancient ships and gods and mermaids with flowing golden hair, the charm of patch of silent darkness into singing sunlight. If you look at, uh, if you read it, or uh, uh, reread it, and reread it, you realize that it is a pointer towards the last phase of an artist's journey. There is a line looking for the roots of rootless trees. What are these rootless trees? It suddenly reminded me of the first floka from the 15th Adhyay of Bhagavad Gita. Urdhavula madhashakam ashvattam prahuravyam vedamsyasya pranani yastam vedasavedavit. The tree of life, its roots are up there in the eternity. It stops it early. The roots of our existence are not here, down below. They are out, up there, in the sky, in the eternity. And uh, these branches are nothing. I mean, our life is like this. You know? But if you really want to go to the roots, then it is a rootless tree, or the roots are not visible. The poem also speaks of silent darkness that becomes the singing sunlight. What is silent darkness? The silent darkness of unawareness, the silent darkness of uh, ignorance, uh, what they call is avidya, the silent darkness of not knowing what you want or where you are going. But if you are prepared to make a solitary journey, then it is quite possible that the ignorance disappears. The ignorance disappears and your life is lit up with, with understanding, they call it Kevala Jnana in spiritual language, Andharati Mirandasya, or what? Adnanati Mirandasya. So, this is the beginning, you know, this is the beginning of an artist. He wants to be left alone. It is a very solitary activity. All actors are solitary. It is done in solitude. And he really doesn't want to be connected with people, particularly when he is creating something. And if he's sincere, if he's honest, if he is a, a man of integrity, a woman of integrity, then he would uh, try to express again wrong, wrong word. He would try a work where his inner turmoil is manifested. 
their world becomes incomprehensible to people. I mean, I am not a very difficult playwright to understand, but people have asked even me, what do you write for? Whom do you write for after all? I mean, looking at Gaitonde's painting or Prabhakar Kolte's painting, I mean, people are really, uh, you know, at the sea and you know, who are you painting for? Now we try to be polite and I say, well, we write for you and how do you answer this effrontery? Because the question, whom do you write for? It is implicit in the question that we have to write for them. We have to create for them. If you are not satisfying them, if you are not entertaining them, if you are not enlightening them, then what are we doing? So it is a part of our social responsibility which is really not true. That is talking to himself. He's trying to probe, search, and it is a solitary journey. I mean, we take the effrontery in our stride, but we go back to our solitary journey. This is a very private journey, more private and more personal than death itself. People who are into creating know this. People who aren't, who are only consumers, would ask these questions. So, when I had thought about these things, I, I was, I still am at this stage where the poet has written about uh, uh, an artist wanting to be uh, alone, wanting to retire into his solitude so that, etc., etc. I was wondering if I can do it. If it is a collective art, a part of a collective art. I mean, Beckett was lucky. Somebody produced his play, Breath, which ran for 38 seconds, and people drove for two hours to watch it. Two and two, four, four, four hours to watch it. I wouldn't be able to do it. That is one big limitation on a playwright. That is, I think, one of the reasons I have not written anything in the last 15 years because I find it very limiting and constricting. You know, I have, uh, I'm into essays these days. I remember Arto here and Grotowski, big names, but it was Arto who first thought that uh, he has to free himself from the tyranny of language. You know? He was not only displeased, he was angry with the French theater of his time. And he said, people come and blabber their mouths out and what's happening, this is not theater. So he wanted to dissociate himself from language in his theater. And he replaced the language with a primal sounds. Actors would come and cry and laugh and create various sounds. They were primal sounds and that is how they wanted to connect because Artho believed to go back to the primal existence, the primal, primal feelings of our existence. Grotowski went uh, one step ahead where the actor's body became the vehicle of expression. The actor expressed through his body and they were extremely uh, devoted. They had gone through penance a lot. I mean, I know because I had visited Grotowski in Poland in November in 78. I had seen there, but Gorodowski had told me that he had uh, stopped doing theater. And he was surrounded by a sort of silent aura. I didn't ask much. But I have seen his actor performing. And I mean, he, it was a rehearsal kind of thing, but he was himself. He was not bothered about who was watching him. That was one uh, very moving experience. And I thought maybe you know, people could do this in theater. But then it becomes very esoteric. 
this kind of theater becomes very esoteric it is uh, it is only for those people who want to share something like this now since i have already made made a statement that people want to reach the absolute or eternity all seekers even scientists they want to know at least what eternity is mystics also disappear into eternity so also artists but there are two responses to this you have heard of susan sontag and she says uh, in her upper essays that the modern artist negates everything he negates everything he negates society he negates communication he negates human contact he negates societal norms and finally he negates his art also and then he wants to retire in silence on the face of it uh, you think that yes it is one way of looking at it i talked to you about arto and we know that arto ended up in madness he was in, into a uh, lunatic asylum for a long time he took refuge into madness when he could not find silence van gogh who put a revolver on his head and killed himself arto he gave up writing poetry at the age of 18 and went to abyssinia and slaved there all his life till he died of cancer so this kind of refuge in death is the answer to all death finishes all there is no silence death nullifies everything death finishes everything and when you come to think of it you realize that the number of artists particularly in the 20th century who committed suicide it is a formidable number in such a situation people who are trying to reach that level of silence the very concreteness of the artist tools appear as a trap like i told you i mean theater is so concrete i mean language is so concrete and i am completely trapped into it how can i dismiss it totally and yet be a theater person i cannot do that so the very concreteness of my medium the very concreteness of my tools are a sort of deterrent are uh, they become a sort of trap according to susan sontag art becomes the enemy of the artist because it denies him realization that is silence moksha nirvana absolute eternity call whatever it is because silence is not feasible either conceptually or in reality this is uh, i think a very negative take it is very nihilistic also the entire response to the situation is nihilistic and this is something maybe incomprehensible uh, to an indian artist the indian tradition the indian artist response to this is beautifully reflected in rohini tai's small sukta like sentence i didn't want to go anywhere there is no expectation there is no expectation the only thing you are supposed to do is practice do work work hard and uh, this response this indian response is totally against totally contradictory to the response which is uh, which is stated by susan i had long talks with some of my friends like pandit suresh talwalkar rohita hasel dancers sujita bide and then 
painters like Prabhakar Kunti, sometimes Akbar Padamsi also. Once I had a long session with Akbar Padamsi. And I realized instinctively that they were following the Indian tradition of working tirelessly, doing sadhana is the word. And now I don't know how sadhana can be translated into English because it's such a uh, loaded work with many Indian connotations available only to an Indian, not a Western ones. Doing sadhana without giving up, without an expectation. I'm sorry I could never meet Gayatron there, but his work intrigued me no end. I think he was trying to do this, exactly this, reaching, the, trying to reach the silence. His works became more and more abstract in his later uh, phase. Now, come, uh, I will come to the uh, practice of an Indian artist. I'm, I'm like, like, we'll talk about vocalists to begin with, because that is the purest form. That is the purest form of expression available to human beings. An artist starts doing his sadhana tirelessly, trying to reach a, a particular level, not a particular, the highest level of excellence. That is the sadhya, you know, that is the destination. All that an artist wants to reach that destination, which is total excellence, total excellence. And some do. And when they do, what happens? Is that the end of the journey? Supposing you have reached the highest um, form of excellence, is that the end of the journey? What do you do next? I mean, you do get worldly goodies and awards and Padmasris or Padmabhusha or whatever. And if that is uh, what the artist is getting and is this happy with it, then we'll say that, well, his journey has ended, but a real seeker artist is not concerned with those things. When he reaches that point of great excellence, when he completely steeped into his art, mind, body, soul, he suddenly realizes that this excellence, this highest achievements in his particular respective field, or maybe it's painting or maybe it's music, it has opened doors to another territory here and now he has to walk into that territory, walk through that territory. And here art becomes the sadhana. Art which was sadhya first becomes sadhana. And here she takes the artist by his finger and takes into that territory, which ultimately may lead to the eternal silence. So this is not uh, a simple journey. I mean, I can only imagine. I mean, this is just an intellectual understanding of what the journey must be like. But uh, higher the ideas of excellence, longer and inhumanly demanding becomes his art. It is a journey fraught with labor, intense pain, intense suffering. You have to pay a very heavy price and steadfast devotion. Art is a difficult deity to please. It's not easy to please art. Once, once pleased, art is extremely kind and merciful and it leads you to that final destination which you are vaguely aware of which you were vaguely longing for. I think of Emily, Dick I did mention Emily Dickinson uh, while uh, I told you about Susan Sanason Dark negating an uh, artist in the modern artist negating life, etc. And how their search for eternity or silence was futile. 
I think of Emily Dickinson, who talks about it very positively. I mean, they, she preceded the 20th century artists, you know. And uh, she makes it very clear also. Exaltation is in the going of an inland soul to see past the houses, past the headlines into deep eternity. And there's another famous poem, which you all know. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. And the carriage held just ourselves and eternity. So ultimately, it is the total, I mean, devotion, which ultimately leads you to this. The very meaning of this is eternity, maybe. So, what is eternity? I mean, eternity is that zone. I mean, if you can imagine yourself going beyond all the galaxies, beyond the sky, you know, beyond the skies, into that infinite expanse. Which has no beginning, which has no middle, no end. It holds everything, all the galaxies and everything manifested and unmanifested. And which is the source of all this, and into which everything will merge. This total silence. There's a beautiful OV in Danishwari in the last uh, chapter. The eternity, I'm uh, sorry, not deep, eternity speaking to the mouth of. Saint Daneshwar, she's, and eternity says, um, Swami me sadodita, sahaja me satata, sarva me sarvagata, sarva I am the sovereign, I am constant, I am everything, I am into everything, and I am beyond everything. Now you cannot really call it space even, that it is a non-space. It is the source of all, which envelopes the seen and unseen, manifested and unmanifested. This perhaps has silence, which we really cannot experience when we are completely living in a three-dimensional existence. They say there are 10 dimensions. And un un unless and until you go beyond these ten, 10 dimensions, it's really not possible to perceive what is happening beyond our material world. And that is where the artist wants to go. Whether he goes there, whether he reaches there or not is irrelevant here. And again, you don't have to be an artist to reach there. There are very um, ordinary looking person who perhaps have reach that destination. That's a different issue. We are talking about artists and our art. So ultimately, art propels you into this direction. It is up to you if you really want to run away from it, if you really don't want to face it. Well, I mean, you can have your goodies and be happy. No quarrel. But then the basic restlessness, the basic unhappiness of the artist which is existential, as I said, compels him to walk through these roads. We have very concrete, we don't really have concrete uh, examples of this. Uh, I mean, music, yes, but then it is again very transient. You listen to a concert, now it is recorded and all that. I'm not talking about you, but you go to a concert and the moment uh, it is over, well, you come back with certain impressions where you really feel that you have traveled to that indefinable, unspecifiable area of uh, silence. You feel that. You don't want to talk about it. I mean, I have not come back across the concrete except, except Taj Mahal. I mean, you will be surprised I'm talking about Taj Mahal. I think it, it, it is a concrete manifestation, manifestation of what silence is. It is surrounded by hundreds of people, and yet 
whenever I mean, I visited Taj Mahal at least four or five times. Every time I went there, that it is uh, uh, there is uh, the entire architecture is shrouded in silence. You know? Nobody can crack that silence. Thousands of people are talking to each other, talking on their mobile phone. Children are crying, but uh, you think that the Taj Mahal is uh, really completely oblivious of the crowds. It is completely immersed into an all parisian silence, you know, like a lily slipping into the bosom of a lake. You know, it's completely within the gaze is turned inverse. This is the only architecture that has given me this experience. Otherwise, it's very difficult to you know, create a concrete uh, visual of what silence could be. Now, uh, I did try to write a play about this uh, dilemma and uh, whoever is in theater, whether it is an actor or a director or uh, a writer, he has to face this dilemma. I wrote a play about 15 years ago, an actor exits, and this actor is in, the, in that area, uh, which is a territory which is after death. But if before the final realization. Nobody does it, of course. Amar told me that you should do it. And uh, if I'll, I'll direct it if you are acting in it. I said, no chance, you know, <laughs> impossible. So it was shell for good. Now, if you look at the history of theater, most of the major playwrights have tried to do this. They have tried to achieve this from uh, Shakespeare to Pirandalu to Beckett, you know. They have tried to do it. They have striven to transcend the barriers of these three dimensions. Shakespeare openly says that, well, this is uh, the world is a, a stage and all the characters, etc., etc., you know, even Danish 400 before, uh, 400 before. Shakespeare, Nanishwarya said Natanats, dance of actors. Now, uh, all these people have tried to transcend the barriers of three dimensions. And uh, we do get uh, an inkling of what they are striving to do, but it is never, it never comes to uh, it never comes to it comes to cl comes close to the experience when you listen to music i think western classical music is as spiritual as indian classical music you know and particularly if there are no words it is much better at least as far as i am concerned words bother me words do bother me i mean there are bandishes and all that and beautifully built and but that is a part of craft and the real singing is in Alapi or Dupat, you know. So, all said and done, one says that to reach the purest, to reach the unimaginable, unspecifiable, to reach ultimate silence, which can, you can call realization, moksha, nirvana, whatever. To reach ultimate silence, then you have to have pure tools. You have to have pure tools, pure means to reach the pure. Which means, I might give up many things. I might even give, my, give up my art. Like Susan, Susan Sontag said that, I renounce everything. Not waiting for something to happen also is renunciation. But as long as the mind is ticking, as long as the mind is continuously blabbering, it's not possible, which means that the mind has to be pure. Now I know I am going into some very dense and maybe cliche. This, it might sound like a cliche, but this is what it ultimately means. 
Keats has said that I don't remember the sonnet. Uh, sonnet to the great, O to the Gracian Guru. Thou solid form thus tease us out of thought as that eternity. And I don't know if I can achieve it in theater. Somebody, may, I mean, Beckett is a shining example. He, he succeeded in many ways, but not totally. So for me, it looks an unending journey. It looks an unending journey, whether you like it or not. But once you put your feet into this, you have to trudge on. You have to trudge on. And as Rohinjai said, as maybe they said that, uh, well, you have to forget waiting also. I mean, you know, don't expect, don't wait for something to happen. Do your work, do your job, that's all. This is sort of ascetism. This is sort of renunciation. An artist has to leave, you know, it's a, it's a way of life. There is no journey. It is ascetism at its highest. During all this process, again, we may reach the level of excellence. We may not. Again, we are reaching the highest stage of excellence. May not take you on that path while an artist struggling may suddenly realize himself that he is, he has not reached that level of excellence yet. He is on a different path. It's, it's all very relative. Once you know this, once you accept this, everything becomes insignificant. Everything becomes insignificant. Because waiting for something to happen is a part of it. If it is renunciation, then all that you can, all you have to, all you want to do is do your work. It is out of purification. Purification because I'm saying that your tools have to be extremely pure to reach the ultimate, to reach the ultimate pure then it is a purification of self. Maybe in the process, the artist himself is purified and also his art. And maybe even after that, after all this happens, hoping if this happens, silence may follow. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to me. I, I will request you not to ask me questions. Rather, I would ask you to either contribute to my confusion or clear up my fog. Santa. Everybody seems to be in a fog. <laughs> Somebody had asked a question in the beginning. How could an actor rooted in language achieve state of silence in his art? But this question had been asked before you gave your lecture. So I think it has been answered. But any other responses, we'd be very happy to have. I didn't quite catch what, uh, catch, uh, what you were saying, you know. 
uh, I'm saying that uh, somebody had asked a question, uh -huh. uh, but that was before before you spoke. So uh, I think you've already answered that question. Oh, I. Yeah. No, uh, it's that all. It is my answer. My answer to that, but uh, whether it is uh, uh, what is it legitimate or not, I don't know. It's a very personal response to the problem, or I don't know if I should call it a problem. But these are the um, idea that have been haunting me for ages because nothing would uh, nothing would help me get over the restlessness and the search and uh, angst, you know. So what I was looking for, I still don't know what I'm looking for, but maybe if it's like this, well, I shouldn't be a playwright. I don't know if a playwright can achieve this. So I think uh, if there are no responses, then I should be. I can't hear you. You know, I mean, I'm. What's the problem? Oh, there's some problem. Hello. Yes. Aparna, Anit, everybody's here. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Anit. Aparna, how are you? <laughs> and then you found the time to listen to me, okay. Well, I think what uh, Mahesh Alpinchbar seemed to have done is to raise some very interesting question, uh, both emerging from his personal journey and what he had learned by interacting with others like Rohini Bhatte or Prabhakar Kolke or Gaitonde, Kumar Gandhar. It was a very rich uh, uh, tapestry that he was able to weave. I thought that he left the dimension of time altogether. Perhaps he, he, he did not I mean, the fog, fog seems to have gone, and then uh, not much said about time, that the dimension of time. But be that as may, I think it has been a remarkable uh, personal account, rich with insight and with issues which collective art cannot possibly address uh, the issue of silence. I started wondering whether there have been moments in, let's say, great productions that we can think of in India, where such a moment of pause would also be thought to be a moment of silence, achieved and because of the tragic n nature of theater, disappears. It's there for a moment. But maybe there are such moments possible. But that's about all. Um, theater speaks. Speaks through many languages, not merely the verbal, but also the gestural language that makes the time and space dimensions also speak in a manner. So I think there should be a way in theater, I don't know how, whether when theater should be able to speak silence. That is a paradox. Well, creativity and imagination and, and sadhana are all paradoxes. That I, I think the basic convention I show. Yes is uh, the artist trying to reach that territory where 
the very concepts of time and the space collapse. Yes. Yes. But the concept of time and collapse are a creation of human intellect. Yes. So as long as we are trapped in these concepts, as long as we are more trapped into the three dimensions, the journey becomes extremely difficult. Yes. And the artist is constantly struggling with this, you know, trying to or uh, trying to free himself from the shackles. And yet he cannot. I mean, I don't know if there is any artist who has really managed to do. They say that, well, um, um, uh, Anjali Bhai Malpekar, who was a great vocalist and who was the teacher of Kumar Gandharva. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the popular story is like that. Her, she had a guru and she to, uh, he told her not to sing and she stopped singing. And she stopped singing at the age of 28 something. But she used to tutor students. Uh, uh, but people who have heard her, I mean, Kumar Gandharva, you know Kumar Ji very well. Yeah, yeah. You know Kumar Ji. And Kumar Ji used to tell even Kalapin told me, I mean, Vasundhana told me that there was a moment when she sang, you know, the entire room was as if lit up with a white light. And she stopped for a moment. There was total pause in the room, not silence. So she must have touched that area. I don't know what happened, but when Kumarji says something like this, one wonders what he really means and what he experienced. People do go silent after some time, you know. They do renounce everything because now art has done whatever art could do for that particular artist. Later on, it becomes redundant. Like when I met Grotowski in 78, he had his laboratory going on, but he was not directing places. And he said, uh, Mahesh, I don't, want, I don't really want to talk about it. I said, why not? He said, I'm not directing anymore. I'm, I'm not doing theater, in fact. They are there because they have been with me for a long time. I said, why do you, why, why have you stopped doing theater? He says, theater has given me what I wanted. That's all. He was a seeker. I, I mean, this is again a personal response to his personality. But he seemed, I mean, there was a kind of stillness about him. And stillness and silence, these are two things which we cannot really experience. We think, I mean, we think that it was, I was still, he was still. This is a very loose way of using expressions in the morning. Language is very deceptive. I am reminded of what Kumarji once said, talking about Nirgun. He yeah. said, Nirgun me to awaz me shun paida hona chai. Now, how do you do that? Uh, it's it's a, a paradoxical situation once again, where awaz to sagun hai na? Wo to nirgun nahi ho sakti. Aur usme shun ne kaise paida ho? So I, I think uh, the, the basic struggle is of all artists, including you as a major playwright, is twofold. One, to make the impossible happen. Two, to make the inevitable available. So I think there are many, many other steps in a poetic and a creative journey where you can partly achieve and partly not. And you keep on struggling with these binaries, which are, as you said, uh, created by human intellect. And, and and the, and the notion that we had, even in sadhana, that it is deshati and kalati. You quoted Ganeshwar saying uh, sarvatit. Yeah. Uh, now, so the sarvatit is also deshati and kalati. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, fine. I mean, this is, this is something which we can discuss uh, at length. Uh, but I think our time is now coming to the end. And uh, on behalf of uh, Nimi Nidhi and 
नटरंग प्रतिष्ठान वी थैंक महेश एलकुंजवार फॉर दिस वेरी enlightening disturbing uh, interrogative uh, personal uh, account or uh, and for all thanks to all of them who have been listening this will be available on youtube very soon thank you very much namaskar <laughs> thank you so much thank you thank you ashok Bye. and thank you mahesh this is pankaj thank you uh, mid mid Eighties in Nagpur. Who is speaking? I just said, this is Pankaj here. Where is I just no, heard you after. It's many years. No, I don't see you. Uh, yeah, I I have a problem with the video, but I can see you very clearly, and I hope you can hear me clearly, Mahesh. It's really okay. wonderful hearing you. One quick, small little point. Eternity, moksh, nirvana, equals silence. Creative art is part of creation. so the question very often asked is what is beyond creation possibly it is that silence possibly it is that momentary stillness i think spiritual seekers are seeking and it's really lovely to have heard you uh, we all have been struggling with this but it's fantastic to be in touch after so many years yes mahesh thank you so much thank you thank you everyone thank you so thank you thank you so we we'll, thanks yeah we'll finish the meeting and we'll speak on thank you very much